John Furrier, founder of SiliconANGLE, and I'd like to introduce uh, Amar Kapdiath from Evault to kick it off, and we're going to start the debate right after this. Good evening. Welcome to Evault. We are your hosts for tonight, uh, and my name is Amar Kapadia. Before we get started on today's exciting topic, I know Randy has kicked off the storm with the open letter. I've never actually seen press at a meetup before, so, <laughs> so it should be exciting. Uh, just some quick logistics. Restrooms are out that way, and they should be open. If they aren't, you know, let one of us know. There's Wi-Fi instructions and food and drinks. Please enjoy. A quick brief uh, 30 seconds on eVault. eVault is a Seagate subsidiary, and we are in the cloud storage business. We have several software as a service and uh, offerings. And if you think about an enterprise and you see any on-premise storage software or infrastructure, that's on our target. Those are the things we are looking at in terms of adding a Dash as a service. We are also active in OpenStack. We have contributed to Swift 3. Randy, please take note. It's a S3 API on top of Swift. And we are also involved with other projects in OpenStack. So without further ado, I'll uh, hand it back to John. And John can introduce the panel. OK, thank you, uh, Mark. Appreciate it. SiliconANGLE's dedicated coverage to going out to the, with the action is, is really uh, what it's all about tonight. And when we cover the OpenStack Summit uh, in Portland, one of the things we mentioned on the Cube is the new standards process is about the community and documenting it all. And Randy Bias kicked off the great conversation at OSCON and want to continue that coverage. I want to pass it off to uh, Randy Bias of Cloud Scaling, Boris Rensky of Marantis, and Joe Arnold, our host here. Guys, take it away for the great API debate. All right. Thank everyone. Thanks for coming, first of all. Um, so the format of tonight is, because it's an open discussion, right? I think Randy kicked off this discussion in a way that only Randy Bias could do in the community, I think. So I think we owe him a debt of gratitude for being able to, uh, I don't know, create so much momentum and, and dialogue around this issue. Uh, and, and, and the issue is, how important is it to be compatible w with another set of industry APIs that are in broad adoption? And so the, the format of tonight's discussion will be to talk about this issue, ask the, a lot of the important questions, uh, and, and the format will be, I'm gonna, we're gonna kick this off, introduce each other, or in, do introductions of ourselves, uh, and then I have a couple of questions that we'll kick off with, but then I'd really like to ask the audience to participate and ask the questions that you have burning uh, desire to ask uh, <laughs> from between <laughs> Boris and Randy uh, on, on the topic. Um, and we'll go for about an hour here uh, and we'll see where the sparks start to fly. So uh, briefly, so my name is Joe Arnold and I'm the CEO of Swift Stack. And what we do is we focus on the object <coughs> side of OpenStack. And there's a project in OpenStack called Swift, and we've built a uh, product and services around that. Before I was doing that, I actually had the privilege to be able to work with Randy uh, to get inter inducted into, into OpenStack. But before that, I was building out platform services on top of Amazon, one of, one of their early customers. Uh, so th that's kind of the, the background I'll, I'll hopefully lend to the, the questions as they, as they come up. Uh, Boris, could you care to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Boris. I am a co-founder and chief marketing officer at Mirantis. Um, I would imagine that a lot of you folks have heard of Mirantis. If you've heard of OpenStack, or hopefully you have. That means I'm doing my job. Um, we are um, probably today uh, the largest systems integrator around OpenStack. And uh, we're also a technology company. And uh, I guess to kick it off, opening remarks, I wanted to also thank Randy. He's uh, kind of been historically the biggest visionary behind cloud and uh, one of the first people to kind of hop onto the uh, OpenStack bandwagon. Uh, some of you may not know this, but uh, this guy was actually the guy that, uh, <laughs> to a large extent, influenced our existing <laughs> company direction. So a lot of the things that we're doing in OpenStack today is because of him. And probably now he's like, I damn, like, why did I do that? <laughs> but yeah, so, um, you know, just, just you know, two, two, <laughs> two years ago, uh, 
Nobody knew about Marantz as an OpenStack. The, the Randy, other thank you very much. The other um, father <laughs> of the OpenStack is, is, is Randy. I, I couldn't have envisioned, you know, sitting myself next to this guru. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you. So now, please introduce yourself. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, slightly embarrassed. I'm probably flushing red, but that's all good. Um, I'm Randy Bias. I'm the CEO of Cloud Scaling. Um, I'm a longtime infrastructure guy, which I think is a little bit different in a lot of this particular ecosystem. I grew up on infrastructure. I've been doing it for 22 plus years. Got a lot of experience on systems, network, storage, like the whole stack, uh, building data centers, really all those aspects. So uh, building infrastructure clouds has hit my sweet spot. Um, really where I, that started to become something I, I focused on was when I was VP of technology strategy at GoGrid, kind of in a CTO style role. They're kind of leading the direction of the architecture and the platform. Um, and then that really morphed into cloud scaling, which in our early days was a professional services business like Marantis, where we were focused on helping people with strategy and architecture and then eventually large scale cloud deployments, uh, two of which are very uh, uh, relatively famous. One was Korea Telecom, which was one of the top three cloud stack deployments and also one of the first Swift deployments, certainly the first Swift public cloud deployment in Korea. Um, and then the second of which was a company called Internap where we built the first uh, compute cloud and uh, Swift uh, cloud. Actually, all three of us were involved <laughs> with that. So um, we're a very early proponent of OpenStack. We are part of the launch. Cloud Scaling was part of the launch in uh, summer of 2010. Um, and we're really the only one of our competitors out there today who uh, was part of that initial launch and has been deeply committed to OpenStack since the very beginning. So sometimes I find it a little funny because um, people will easily misinterpret my intentions and sort of seem to feel that I am not, that I don't love OpenStack and nothing could be further from the truth. My entire business is built around OpenStack. We've pivoted over to become a product company that offers a product based on OpenStack. I, I am deeply in love with OpenStack and I want it to succeed and that's why I have an opinion and that's why I share it. So let me start by asking, I think one of the first questions when it comes to API standardization and adopting somebody else's standards. Um, and uh, Mark Capadia, the guy who just introduced, uh, introduced the meetup from eVault, wrote a blog post yesterday um, talking about some of the trade-offs, where when you begin to standardize on a set of APIs, particularly one that you may not necessarily control, that that stifles innovation, where you can't make changes uh, to the services or the product offerings that you want to offer. Like, for example, uh, you know, working on erasure coding in Swift, for example. And we may expose new API elements in order to, to add that functionality. You know, networking with quantum, or I guess not quant quantum anymore, neutron. right? Neutron. Your neutron, or yeah. neutron. Uh, uh, what, what do you have to say to, you know, that argument where choosing another API standard limits your ability to add functionality into, into products? Uh, I'll start with Randy first on this one. Um, so there's a, absolutely a trade-off between standardizing and innovation. I think we all know that. To claim there isn't is kind of you know nonsensical. But I think what gets missed a lot of the time is that you know those things kind of follow each other, right? You're sort of innovating at the front end, and then some of the things behind you as you go along are really starting to standardize, right? Uh, HTTP, you know, follows TCP, right? So it's not it's not the zero sum game where like you know I'm either all innovating or I'm all standardizing. You know, it's a much more nuanced kind of situation. And I think when we look at something like the AWS APIs, just to make this more concrete. You know, it's a little ridiculous to say that they stifle innovation uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they're only one of the APIs in OpenStack. Two, they've been extremely stable. So we're not talking about APIs that, you know, supposedly Amazon controls them, but they haven't had, they very, very rarely break backwards compatibility. They, and so we're just talking about them adding new feature functionality in the APIs that aren't exposed in ours, so we would lag them. Big deal, who cares, right? It's a fast follow strategy anyway, embrace and extend. No big deal. So, you know, I, I think it's a valid argument. I just think it sort of misses the mark, which is that in many ways we can do innovation and standardize simultaneously. Forrest, anything to add? Yeah, so, you know, my, my, my take on it is that um, it's definitely a noble cause to support cross-platform API compatibility. And I don't think when we're talking about API compatibility necessarily has to be at Amazon, although Amazon is definitely the most dominant mover there, um, but uh, um, it's, 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 
how do I say that? Um, I, I'd like to level set, I guess, on the argument a little bit first, because um, there is a big difference between taking somebody else's API um, and adopting it as your native API. Any system, in my opinion, always has to have its own native API. Um, and uh, having a native API uh, does not necessarily uh, preclude you from actually you know, going ahead and making some sort of effort to be cross-compatible with other platforms. So um, in the original kind of a manifesto that uh, Randy has produced, um, I think it, was, it wasn't exactly clear uh, what we're talking about. Are we talking about just throwing away the native API behind uh, OpenStack? No, nope, it was absolutely, completely crystal clear. I've had to go back and read it multiple times now because people made those kinds of claims. And in my bullet list, I very clearly did not say that. Moreover, <laughs> you, even, you even put in a follow-on letter, which I think which is was a, even more it's, clear. It's, it's, <laughs> I think it's an indication that it's only okay of me to misinterpret it because everybody misinterpreted to the point where you had to put a follow-on letter afterwards. So let's be specific about, about, about a couple of things here. So um, there is a statement in the technical, uh, uh, the project technical board, sorry, I'm with, um, what's the name of the, the technical project T committee? TCL. Technical committee. Technical, technical, technical committee, committee, right? That said, we're gonna support the uh, one set of APIs, the OpenStack APIs, and everything else is gonna be outside of that. So. Correct question for you, it is the statement that the AWS APIs need to be an official thing as approved by the technical committee to be officially supported and maintained? And is that really what the crux of the debate is here? Well, there's, there's two elements. I mean, I'm okay if they're outside of the core. Like, I, I don't actually have a problem with that. What I want, what I, the first thing I asked is for the community to stop sort of saying like it's us against Amazon, which I think is just a totally ludicrous type of, 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 of uh, attitude. I mean, it's like saying it's OpenStack versus VMware. I mean, we need to go co-op these systems. We, OpenStack is gonna win by, by beating VMware and Amazon at their game, which means co-opting co them. I mean, that's my belief. And so I think we should support the vCloud Director API in the same way we support the AWS API in the ecosystem. Whether it's in core or not, I don't really care. But the second thing that I think is more important um, in a way is that there's sort of this attitude of that Nova has a native API. It's complete and utter bullshit. If you read my first uh, email, you'll see very clearly that the native original API in OpenStack is the EC2 API. That is what it was built with. The Rackspace API was added later and it was checked in called Rackspace. And then it was renamed to Nova at a later date. And it's not an unopinionated API, it's a new different opinion from the AWS API. And that's a huge problem because it constrains uh, OpenStack in as many ways. And people say, oh, Rackspace contributed. No, they contributed a specification, not the code. It was actually done by Anso Labs. That's number one. And number two, you know, if you went and you pulled some functionality out of that API right now, Rackspace is gonna cry foul. Like there's a password reset capability in there now that many people probably don't want or care about. You pull that out and it impacts Rackspace's public cloud. Now, if we really want a native API in Nova, we should say, what does it need to be? What purpose, what, what is it, what purpose does that API solve? And we should build it from scratch. Boris, in the, in the core or outside of the core? Uh, definitely outside of the core, and, um, and I would like to. I would like to kind of. Uh, I, I feel that the whole um, argument is a little bit flawed because it's based on the premise that the OpenStack community historically has been very anti-Amazon, and uh, frankly, I don't see any of that. Um, what you advocating, you know, the community embracing Amazon, but I don't really see any manifestation of a community kind of going the other direction. There are indications if you're sitting from far outside and kind of observing that yes, OpenStack is kind of an anti-Amazon, Amazon competitor, but there are, I can completely, I, I understand it. And the reasons for it is first, it was started by Rackspace effectively. And yes, this API was called Rackspace API originally, but since then the situation has changed dramatically. Um, Rackspace is no longer uh, very heavily involved in any of the stuff. So in fact, Rackspace is uh, um, not even in the top five contributors. They're, they're smaller contributor to OpenStack, in fact, today than even Mirantis, a much smaller company. Um, second, it's because OpenStack community never really was going around like everybody else and screaming, oh, we are out there to support Amazon API. And uh, uh, the, the, the path for that was really kind of laid by uh, 
guys like Eucalyptus. And the Eucalyptus guys, they took this approach. Like they, they understood they cannot be OpenStack, so they have to kind of hinge themselves on Amazon and create this marketing push and say that, oh, we are that not all, OpenStack, so we are Amazon. That all predates and OpenStack, so that's not how it went down. Actually, oh, Eucalyptus not, that is, is not, not Eucalyptus, Eucalyptus is predates years OpenStack. Ahead Eucalyptus of open predates stack. OpenStack, but Eucalyptus has moved to embrace Amazon and the whole no, PR that's, push. That's how they started. No, that is not how no, that was their entire business okay. model from the okay, very there's outset. A, there's a, there's a, there was a big <laughs> PR push. Well, wait a second. Let me let me go back to it. Let me go back to it. They started as you know, yet okay, maybe, but they Eucalyptus made their strongest push around um, API compatibility when they made this big PR spiel where they supposedly signed an agreement with Amazon, where Amazon has licensed them the right to actually use their API. And there was a big shebang around it, and the whole thing was just a PR stunt because you can't really license a public API. It's bullshit, and you know it, and you yeah, wrote about I it agree. yourself. Okay. And, and that's, yeah, yeah. I agree. So, so this whole momentum started, and OpenStack was just quiet. And OpenStack, OpenStack did not give a shit because they're already themselves a powerful enough movement. They don't need Th this kind of that's PR That's not stunts. exactly true because there was a whole response like uh, prior to that where Citrix left OpenStack and went to the Apache Foundation, and they made all these claims about uh, AWS compatibility sure. at that point in time. And I remember, because I've had these conversations going with the Rackspace senior leadership like Jim Curry and Lou Mormon for a very long time, and I remember that they, those two guys who had just been like, hell no, we gotta yeah. get the EC2 API out of the system, suddenly backtracked their entire attitude when Citrix bailed, and there was this whole kerfuffle that happened, and the whole community was very engaged on the discussion of, yes, we want AWS compatibility in the system at that time. That predates yeah, the whole yeah. eucalyptus no, thing. Yeah. So that, you're talking about sort of an anticlimactic I can, thing. But, but that thing is a long time ago, and that's completely different. Where Rack Summer of 2012. Today, it's in, in terms of the OpenStack development velocity, that's like a thousand years. And, and right, you can't At least take two okay. So this is debating timelines, <laughs> and I think, you know, that's, so going forward, right? So I guess one, I'm going to ask one more question, and I'd, I'd invite uh, whomever wants to ask the next question, uh, please start coming up. I think there's a microphone. Amar, uh, where, uh, can, can you help, um, uh, like, uh, get a microphone to whomever wants to ask uh, the, fir the first question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beg, beg the proposition, uh, or beg the, beg the case, right? Is, is what's important about being Amazon compatible, is it, is it about the API, or is it about that <laughs> ecosystem that Amazon has created? Where if you get plugged into the Amazon cloud, you're surrounded by all sorts of other services that you can consume, some from Amazon, some not from Amazon, by people who have set up shop in there and selling platform services. Um, how much does OpenStack really, how, long, how much does OpenStack deployments really gain if they don't have that ecosystem? How important is just the compatibility for, from a business perspective, from, from rollout, from hybrid clouds? Um, I can how, much, how, how important is that for what you're seeing in the field with customers to be able to transition back and forth between those two environments? Tactically speaking, it's not important. Um, and that's what we have seen um, in the context of now over 50 OpenStack implementations. This is early days. Strategically speaking, the importance is going to grow. But I do not think that you can ever really reach the cross-platform compatibility with two independent ecosystems innovating and building their native APIs independently. Anybody who is in their sane mind and is trying to run an application on top of uh, uh, OpenStack that is running on-premise and maybe burst into um, AWS, they will use some sort of proxy in the middle. And there's plenty of libraries you can do. You can, you can use something like Fog, you can use JClouds, and if, if your application is, is dependent on two systems, you will always have a guy inside and a library inside, a guy responsible for that library, who's going to be, and that's going to be the single kind of a checkpoint <coughs> that you control. You will never trust two communities to maintain compatibility and just run across. I mean, uh, APIs don't matter. I, I don't know why we're stuck on this. And I, I kind of made the point, you know, that it's about the architecture to begin with. And I, I don't understand why people don't get this. APIs always expose a subset of functionality. It is impossible for them to, to provide the entire uh, richness of the architecture that they basically talk to. They're an application programming interface. 
So they inherently are a contract to the system behind it. So right now, if you go to any of these clouds as a for example, and you spin up an instance, there's no way to guarantee that instance comes up in any amount of time. You can't specify it with the API. You get no SLAs from the provider, whether it's a private or public cloud. It comes up at some arbitrary time between a few seconds or a couple hours. Right? So if you build your application, even using the abstraction like jclouds and fog, and it assumes, because it's been running on an AWS, that instances always come up within 10 minutes, and you go and you stick down on another cloud, and the behavior is different, you're screwed. Because there actually has to be a way that you've got a reference architecture that you model against, and then you're measuring how that behaves so that when you're actually doing some kind of cross-cloud compatibility, you're doing it based off of the behavior of the system, not the APIs. Right? APIs can be semantically equivalent. If you look at Google Compute Engine and AWS, they're the exact same API, except the APIs themselves look totally different because the syntax is different, the semantics are the same, and they expose a very similar architecture behind them. I agree. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and in fact, you, you wrote a blog about that. And All right. I said, Dave, I, said, I said I agree. Dave, Dave has a question here for us. Okay, I thought I'd... Is this on? No. Okay, I won't tap. I guess it's, <laughs> it's not for us, okay? It's, it's for the... <laughs> sorry about that, folks. <laughs> okay, so let's just say for argument's sake that it was a good idea to uh, mirror the um, AWS APIs. Uh, I, would, I can imagine how that might make sense possibly for uh, compute, storage, some of the basic components that a lot of applications use. But it would be absolutely insane for the entire community to say, okay, you know, carte blanche, we're going to go replicate all of the APIs that Amazon ever does. They're a for-profit company trying to pursue their own interests. There's no freaking way they have the best interests of everybody else in mind. So where would you draw the line? So this is kind of along the lines of uh, Amazon isn't asking uh, the us to use them as a standard Why? and they're proliferating projects and services. It's not going to stop. It's not only that, but let's just say that we all of a sudden said, okay, let's go replicate their APIs. Don't you think they'd find that amusing and perhaps use that in some way? <laughs> of course. Yeah, that's exactly what Randy was talking about, basically, that uh, you, know, you can't have, if we're talking about native <coughs> API, you can't have two systems that have the same low-level native API. Um, you can have an awkward attempt at it, and then it'll boil down to just you kind of uh, mimicking uh, the, the, the system uh, awkwardly and exposing similar same API. But uh, I think today uh, we are still way too early uh, along the innovation curve, uh, both it pertains to Amazon and it pertains to OpenStack Squared to um, actually really even concern ourselves so deeply about those issues. And the reason why I think the community today um, in OpenStack has not really you know, proactively embraced Amazon API even embraced the um, you know, Amazon compatibility issue because the, the stuff that the OpenStack community is struggling with today is much more basic and concrete. It's about uh, just feature function acceleration and just making the shit work. I mean, it's hard still, it's still new. So uh, why, why are you starting to think about uh, you know, this cross stuff compatibility when it's such a challenge to just you know, deploy an OpenStack cloud and make it work? I mean, I think that it sort of gets to a pretty deep divide in our perspectives. You know, I would say that OpenStack is more akin to the Linux kernel. And the idea that it, uh, it'll ever be a complete cloud operating system is completely ludicrous. And it's really a framework that will allow us to build cloud operating systems that do different things. Just like you can take the Linux kernel and wrap a distribution around it and run it on Monte Vista on an embedded appliance, or you can run Cray Linux on a, on a supercomputer and everything in between. And I think it's really a mistake to pretend that OpenStack will be something that's going to be this single unified reference architecture that you know is totally interoperable. Because in doing that interop, you're going to reduce innovation. It's the yeah. same kind of problem as having the yeah. standards-based solution because you have to say that this disk drive behaves like this disk drive. It's inherent in the, in the issue of creating interop. You reduce and you stifle innovation. And so the thing is, is that if you sort of give up that OpenStack isn't a complete cloud operating system, if you say it's just a framework and I'm always going to have to add stuff, 
then this kind of notion that um, people should stop innovating around like the AWS APIs doesn't make any sense because there needs to be room for people like me to say, look, the best way to deploy OpenStack successfully in production is via this model that I've developed that does leverage the AWS APIs and AWS as a reference architecture, and then that becomes the AWS flavor of OpenStack, and everybody else in the community is allowed to do what they want to as well. And I have absolutely no objection to any of this, and I think that there should be an AWS flavor, and I think you guys should take the lead, and I think you have been doing that to a large extent already, and build this uh, AWS flavor. But uh, I guess the point is, um, you know, how much sense does it make to focus on it right now? And I think that I agree with you completely that uh, OpenStack will never be this one monolithic so I, I thing. I didn't say focus, one I said embrace. I said stop oh. pushing away. But I, that, that, that goes back to my first argument that really OpenStack well, I didn't have a never chance to rebut that. Okay, well go ahead and rebut that. But I, I remain convinced that there's no uh, kind of a, um, opposition, in the native opposition in the OpenStack community against AWS. And then again, well, like, what does it even mean? Like the open source community, just go ahead and commit code, and, and you, you drive it, everybody drives the ecosystem absolutely. drives it. There's no one guy that says, we're going to be against AWS. A code absolutely. rules. So make that's the code, and you get your AWS compatibility. A absolutely, but that's not the, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the point. The point is, is that um, in many ways, Rackspace poisoned the well on this, right? I mean, you know, w the Rackspace APIs aren't in there as an accident. I it's mean, a, it's, it's, it's a, a very deliberate it move. Was, it was a, there was a decision, <laughs> yeah, as, as it, mentioned, and so not, I think Randy's true. point is saying, hey, let's, let's at least embrace this, open this and, up. So and after, uh, they, <laughs> after that, you know, it's, it, it, they were the top number one contributor until recently. Granted, I'll give you their, their yeah. influence in the community is waning, so it is a good time for me to go, hey. frankly, in some ways, kick them in the teeth and say, look, I think we were led down the wrong path here, which is what I did. Uh, Je uh, Jeff Arnold has a question. I'll repeat it since he's not near the mic. That's, you'll, go okay, you'll go over the mic. Okay, go great. The mic. So I guess my question, well, boy, Careful my question is: Did POSIX constrain Linux? I mean, Linux only succeeded because they started off saying, "We're going to do a POSIX, a, a po an open source POSIX op operating system," and without POSIX compatibility, Linux would have never got accepted because it would never it would never have been an easy safe adoption move from Solaris or HPUX or whatever so you know this conversation so far has completely ignored customers completely ignored the ecosystem it's all been all about the development community and I think that sucks I think that the, the so nobody has said what's the cost to the customer of having these incompatible APIs. And it's as I mean, Randy's right in saying that you know we can have multiple APIs, but you know I, I would like to be able to take the the Netflix OSS and just run it. Yeah. Okay, and I can't. Now, if we have get it's, it's and it's not just as simple as saying well let's let's support this. Full support for the for the APIs. It really isn't that simple. I, I totally agree. And the reason it's not that simple is because we've poisoned we've poisoned the well in two ways. One is we've poisoned the well by putting in existing putting in APIs which have constrained the system in certain ways. The other thing we've done, frankly, is to let too much crap into the system, too much variation, too many options, too many extensions. And as a result, it's very, very difficult. And I speak as somebody who's working for a company that's building mm -hmm. plugins and building uh, you know, components to go into OpenStack. It's very Updating difficult. Poisoning it. It's very difficult to create a subset of that collection of all stuff we built, which actually provides the, the right level of semantic compatibility. Yeah, so why, yeah. why is it that we can't, as a community, say, hey, running Netflix OSS on OpenStack is an objective? And it then make it happen whether it's on the damn OpenStack APIs be. or not. It should be. And one of the other, um, while I've got the mic, I will say, you know, one of the things that we, we recently celebrated the, th the third birthday of the project. And a lot of people were very happy. Look how much we've done. I was disappointed. In three years, we have not even replicated the basic services that were in AWS in 2009. I don't care what API, just the services. Where's Elastic Load Balancing? You know, we don't have basic cloud services. Come and talk to me about stifling innovation when we've actually out-innovated AWS. And until that happens, all I want is to get a really kick-ass open well, source well, system which is, meets the basic functionality. Behind. I think that uh, though this, this, this comment is really not about the uh, you know, compatibility or incompatibility of APIs or embracing AWS. 
basically what you're saying is that you're unhappy with the existing structure of how the development process and how the ideas bubble up to the top and get implemented in OpenStack. It's too distributed, too many organizations involved and they're getting poisoned from all kinds of different sides. Instead, you should have more control, more of a kind of a um, be benevolent dictator mentality that, that was present in Linux and is absent in OpenStack. And that, that's the argument that I guess that you're making, which is a whole different, whole different debate. Um, and I have my opinion on that as well, but you know. I, yeah, and I think, it's, I think you bring up a good point around the kind of the undercurrent of, of customers and using, the, using these services, right? And, and I think where at least each of, each of our companies were involved in just working on our <laughs> customers' projects and we're contributing back as we're meeting those needs as, as functionality develops. And so, and I, I don't know about what you guys are finding, but at least what we're finding is that customers are adopting OpenStack because sometimes they have some pretty unique requirements. Um, so, it, you know, in terms of what, what you guys are seeing, how important, you know, back to that question, how important is it for having complete compatibility between what you're developing to solve some unique problems at the customer site to bridge that out to the, to the, pu the public environments? It's a, or to it's answer a, Jeff's question, I guess, directly. It's a, it's a kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. I think that, I mean, what you said is basically OpenStack, and you mentioned that as well, that OpenStack is really not a product. It's more like kind of like a framework, and you can build all kinds of different clouds out of it. And because it's early and because it's being innovated against so much, this variability is just great, and there's so many different configurations. And yes, I agree, that's definitely a curse. And if you come into OpenStack and you expect to, you know, download upstream OpenStack packages and get like a VMware-like boxed-in experience where everything just works and all the decisions have been made for you, then, I mean, you're coming to it with the wrong mentality. Ultimately, yes, there will be different kinds of OpenStack. There'll be cloud scaling OpenStack, there'll be Mirantis OpenStack, there'll be Piston OpenStack. There'll be different opinionated uh, kind of uh, implementations of it and opinionated to a different degree. But the reason OpenStack succeeded to begin with, I think, is because of that flexibility. And Absolutely. Because, because that's why everybody started embracing it. Uh, because there's, there's an enormous pent up demand there for, for some, sort of, some sort of framework that gets you 80% of the way to the functioning cloud and allows you 20% where you can build plugins and make decisions and change around the API. And that's really been the primary driver behind OpenStack's success so far. All right, so we have an online question from uh, Craig Tracy, and he, he asks, uh, what I have not heard is how API adoption will help or hurt the OpenStack adoption curve. So will, will embracing these APIs help or hurt? Like, is, is it more important to create this alternative ecosystem that people can latch on to, or? Well, why wouldn't we want the OpenStack ecosystem plus the AWS ecosystem plus the GC <coughs> ecosystem plus the VMware because, like, why wouldn't we? I can't imagine why we wouldn't. It's a matter of focus, right, in terms of uh, what EC2 can two APIs developed. are in there today. Well, you know, for, like, for example, we, like, we're, like Amara just mentioned the S3 API for, for Swift, something that, you know, we track as well. Um, and we, we ain't, we've been adding architectural components in there so we can better support the S3 API, because arch architecture maps down to that API. Um, but we only do that once we hit a customer who has that issue, and now we need to start folding that. So you are in. hitting those customers who have requirements around the S3 API? We are pulling people off of S3. Right. <laughs> is what we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And so we need to take the fire hose from over here and point it over here into their private environment. And so then when they do that, they, want, they have specific tools and they have specific use cases that they're using. And if we need to, we'll patch them up. But we'll also, they'll also, for new applications, use the, the native API. Because right. that's what they want Sure, that's what they we see build. the same in our customer base. A lot of people want the AWS API so they can migrate off, and it, and it eases that. But they also use a lot of the OpenStack APIs natively. And we allow them the choice of using whichever one works best for them. And it's interesting because it turns out that in many ways, those two different opinions uh, surface in some strange manner. So if you look at the EC2 API, things like EBS uh, are a subset, or VPC are a subset of that entire API, and it's networking functionality that's part of the compute API. And in OpenStack, there's like nine different APIs, and you kind of got to know how to talk to each different one, and it's just winds up looking very different. I would like to add one, one thing before we move on, um, just kind of from our perspective. 
Um, and the reason why I'm kind of, you know, the, the, how would you say it, like making, putting less accent on the whole API compatibility thing in OpenStack today. Because um, in our maybe skewed experience so far, we've seen two kind of uh, entry points into the customer where they are embracing OpenStack. So one is, uh, you know, they're just greenfielding an internal cloud, um, or they're trying to maybe get rid of VMware. Um, and they, the Amazon in that case is not even the picture. They've never touched Amazon. They have zero applications running against Amazon APIs. You come into OpenStack and you know it, it works and, and they buy and it's an easy sale. Now we've had a number of enterprise customers uh, where we try to enter uh, at a different point. These are the guys that have been using Amazon for a long time and they have a bunch of applications that are written to leverage Amazon API. The whole ecosystem is inside and they come in and they're like, well, Amazon is kind of charging us a lot of money. Maybe we can build our internal cloud, OpenStack, move some applications over. And in that case, uh, what happens is these guys, they do research around. Uh, they look at cloud stack, they look at uh, OpenStack, uh, they look at Eucalyptus, and in virtually every single case that we have seen so far, they stick with Amazon anyway, simply because of Amazon's current superiority over all the other solutions. So would have helped if we would have said that we have this API compatibility? No, because they use the 90% of other features that Amazon has that none of the, these OpenStack or CloudStack or Eucalyptus systems have. My we're experience seeing, we're is different. Totally <laughs> different. We're seeing a ton of people claw back from Amazon. Uh, can you state your name and maybe in the company you work for in your question? Sure, yeah. Max from IDM Research. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting conundrum because on the one hand, being open means that you, know, you can allow anything, but at the same time, we can't support everything. Right? Every API is going to just make a nightmare. But on the other hand, you don't have a dictator like say on Ruby on Rails where you could say, I'm just going to cut it and just use one. I wonder if there's not a solution for this whereby we can use the customers and use data. So <coughs> the various APIs we have right now, if we instrument them and collect data, then we can figure out what the customers are telling us in addition to surveys and so on. And in that way, we can make decisions that are not just emotionally involved, but are based on the data. So I'm, I'm actually totally in favor of this. The problem is, is that you see a lot in the community the fact that people are like, oh, I'm not, I'm not sure I should use the EC2 API because I should use the native Nova API, except the native Nova API is the Rackspace Cloud Servers API. So there's already an inherent bias. If we had a different low-level API that didn't have any opinion to which there was the Rackspace API, the EC2 API, and whatever else, then we could let the market decide and we could use that real data. But we don't have that today. Instead, we have an inherent bias that already exists because the Rackspace APIs are somehow the native APIs. Yeah, but I think that realistically, it, it, I, I agree with has been kind of poisoned, but um, this is again going back to my original argument, but I think that, um, you know, they tried to influence it, they did open their APIs, the community started to innovate around their APIs, uh, but I mean, it, it has gone so far now that it just, it, the, the, the former Rackspace API has become the native API for OpenStack. And I mean, I, I'm not saying it's perfect API. It could be, probably could be improved. And I'm all for improving and making a better native API. But I disagree with the premise that the existing OpenStack API is Rackspace API and is somehow by that today inherently poisoned. Another okay, question. sound like you contradicted yeah. yourself, but okay. Please hey, go name, a, name a couple of Hi, I'm David from uh, Puppet Labs. Uh, my question is something that hasn't been touched upon at all in this conversation yet is, is governance. And that's where you know, AWS is very different from POSIX, for example, or you know, I in a lot of ways it feels more like in the early days asking Linux to adopt the Win32 API, namely an API in which the community has no input, no way of, of getting any chan uh, changes in there. Like from a technical point of view in AWS to, to really make it a standard API, you would want to have some sort of discoverability in there, right? which isn't, isn't in there. Um, but there's, there's no way, no chance in hell that anybody's going to convince uh, Amazon to put that in, put that in there. Uh, and that, that's also how you know, the OpenStack API, even though it used to be the Rackspace API, is, is a very, very different animal because it's now governed by the community and there's an open process around it and you know, foundation and, and all these things that make this really a community-driven approach, whereas AWS is a vendor-driven approach. I mean, it's, a great, it's a great point. I mean, we notice it from the Swift world they don't rev the version number, and they change the API. I mean, they do that because they can, and 
Well, I mean, to range this point, the AWS API is pretty stable because we have the ecosystem around it. <laughs> Extremely and they stable. They can't afford to change the API just like that because they will kill the ecosystem. It, I mean, go so if you, it's you more stable than OpenStack. When you API. go talk to the eucalyptus Much guys, more stable. you yeah. know, you go to, when you go talk to the eucalyptus guys, I think they'll they have. There's there's a bit of chasing that, that they're having to do. It is it's, it's always the chasing, core, but, but th then I think we're missing the whole point. The point is embrace and extend and allow people on Amazon to easily get off onto OpenStack or to build hybrid clouds that are connected to OpenStack. If we constrain things and we say, okay, we're only going to do the OpenStack APIs, we inherently limit the total addressable market of OpenStack. Why would we do that? Th I've heard this like ridiculous statement about how like very few of the OpenStack deployments are using the EC2 APS. According to the user survey, it was 30%, 33.5%. I don't know who else is counting here, but that's a third, and that's a lot in market share, okay? We don't want to shut out those people. We don't want to shut out people who want to have AWS compatibility, just like we want don't want to shut out people who want Google Compute Engine ca uh, compatibility and VMware vCloud Director compatibility. We want all those people to come over and use OpenStack, and one of the best ways to do it is to support those APIs as well, and it's okay if they're outside of core, and then allow an on-ramp onto OpenStack. I mean, don't we want OpenStack to win? We have another question. So my name is uh, Victoria Lifschitz. Um, I've been uh, actually running services company that's been doing OpenStack work, uh, funny enough, actually before Mirantis did. So it's been a long time. Uh, but these days I run a different company. I run uh, actually a PaaS, Platform as a Service Company. Mm -hmm. And that colors a lot of my perception around the issues that we were having today. So uh, I want to pick up on the theme of uh, community and also interest. So when we try to debate what's in the interest or against the interest, it's the first question is whose interest and what are we optimizing against or for. So OpenStack is a, a collection of bad fellows who are each by and large a commercial entity who made a conscious choice to embrace OpenStack for their commercial interest, right, as opposed to other alternatives. Now looking at from an ecosystem perspective, we have at least six ecosystems. We have Amazon for sure. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Microsoft. We are fast having Google coming not just with the, with the um, Google App Engine, but also the underlining cloud as well. And then in a private world, we have at least Citrix, uh, VMware, and OpenStack, right? And probably more. So here is six of them. And let's assume we are all competing for <coughs> consumer dollars customer dollars, and we do. So OpenStack community collectively actually does compete with Amazon, right? So when we, when we talk about friend or foe, almost by definition of the structure, Amazon is a foe of anybody who's commercially betting on OpenStack. Or a friend of me. Well, I mean, <laughs> or I a friend of me. I mean, is it, but the way to a fight friend it, and an yes, enemy. we can do we can without can fighting, right? Yeah, you we can argue wanna, about the best be way to fight, and the best way to fight might very well be just opt in their customer base. Yeah, exactly. So uh, here's a question that I have for, for the panel. Given that the name of the game is optimize the interests of OpenStack community, where the focus should be laid? And speaking of API, I find it interesting that it's framed as AWS compatibility debate. But AWS is neither compute nor storage. It's a tremendous amount of web services APIs that are more akin what PaaS platforms tend to provide than what compute and storage uh, infrastructures are. So the question that I have of community, do we want OpenStack compute and storage be the best that it can be competing with EC2 and S3? Or do we really want to, how are we going to play that game, you know, one level up? That's a great question, right? So I think Bo Boris touched on it in terms of um, library support, like JClouds and other provisioning low-level APIs. There's platforms as a service companies, like the one uh, that you're building now, and you have EngineYard and Heroku and DotCloud, and I mean, there's a whole, and then the, the ones from, uh, VMware and Red Hat, they're all producing them. Um, I guess they got spun out in Pivotal. So why, uh, why, why not use that as a mediating layer? And I think Rob Hirschfeld on the, on the, from Dell on the, on the chat also mentioned uh, between automation tools between Puppet uh, and using <coughs> Chef uh, and, and tools like that. Why isn't the abstract, extra abstraction layer up there ra rather than, why are we mucking around down here trying to, to bridge API compatibility? Why don't we rely on that layer 
above that infrastructure to do that okay, abstraction for us. Well, you go. So uh, just one thing real quick, I want to push back just briefly on some of what you said. Uh, you know, when we were at GoGrid, we looked at, when I was at GoGrid, we looked at Amazon and we said, man, these guys are amazing. They're going to make our business. They're like educating all the customers. They're building this massive cloud. Some of those customers are going to peel off. And we were like, yeah, we're working com in the cooperation with those guys to make the pie as big as freaking possible. Because if cloud computing is something that displaces enterprise computing, like that displaced mainframe computing, what if it's 10x bigger like enterprise IT was than, than mainframe IT? We're talking about a massive, massive market. So just driving the whole thing as quick as possible, as fast as possible, and making customers as successful as possible is all that freaking matters. Now, to the issue about why can't we bring a compatibility layer like JClouds or Fog or something like that and run it, the thing is, is that, you know, <laughs> I've done a lot of these deployments on Amazon Web Services. I built a whole framework with Chef and RightScale that would deploy like 100 VM clusters that had image processing capabilities and all this crap in a fully automated fashion. I could do all 100 servers by myself, spin them up in five minutes, run the cluster, spin it down. Clouds don't behave the same. Right? I talked about spin up times earlier, but there's other problems too. Something like Chef or Puppet interrogates the system that it runs on and it determines what it, its IP is. Like in Chef, it's called My IP. If you've got one network interface, which, one that, which IP that is on your box is very apparent. If you've got two network interfaces, it's not as apparent. And if you allow people to have arbitrary numbers of network interfaces like you can with a vCloud, then you know which one is my IP and which VLAN is that plugged into? And how the frick do I even find that stuff out? Because Chef is going to have to do a whole lot more heavy lifting to figure out what the front end VLAN is on a vCloud as opposed to AWS where there is no choice. There's just a freaking network interface. And that stuff is all over the place. It is all over the place. You know, uh, an early customer for us that, well, potential customer was Skype. And they were telling us how they would take their stuff off of Amazon and they put on bare metal and they suddenly got two, three X performance. And it was the same basic configuration. Now here's the problem, right? If your pass or whatever assumes that the box is this big and then you move over to this cloud and the box's performance is half or 25%, then suddenly like all of your logic that's scaling the system could, could be in jeopardy. So these, these things, the, the, just because you have semantic equivalence on the front end of a cloud doesn't mean you have architectural equivalence, and that is, a, that is a huge problem. And those abstractions cannot fix that problem unless there are better APIs that allow us to like, you know, measure the resource in an accurate way. So then what about the projects that are, aren't, that are more <laughs> pass-oriented? Right? With what we're seeing, you know, for example, with the, with the Swift API, it maps very, the API maps very directly down into how the architecture works. Right. And so there's some slight variations in how things are done with S3. Um, Absolutely. And, and then that's not, I mean, you have, what are, I mean, it's not, there's the provisioning APIs, right? That, which would be great to have compatibility between. But then there's the other ones like, that aren't necessarily provisioning APIs, they're services APIs, you know, between like Keystone. What's the, what's the AWS equivalent of Keystone? It, it, do, it uh, doesn't matter, right? Because here's the thing, right? If you go and you measure Amazon Web Services like revenue streams, and w which are, are a, a measure of the adoption of the various services, it's not some even usage pattern, it's a power law distribution curve where you've got EC2, and you've got S3, VPC, EBS, ELB, something like that. And then there's this long tail. Like, I haven't encountered one customer using DynamoDB, not one. So, like, who gives a shit about DynamoDB or, Pin or Beanstalk or any of the other stuff? All we care about is the fat end of the tail and replicating that to make it good enough so that people can get off of AWS onto OpenStack. It's like a no-brainer. I don't even understand why it's contentious. It's ridiculous. I, I think we maybe got away from the question a little bit that was originally asked, but I think you, you touched upon it. I think my, I mean, in general, it's always better to, 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 to interface with a low-level API of a system. If you have a choice, you want to be able to do that. Um, as soon as you move just a little bit up and you introduce something like Fog or JClouds on top, an abstraction layer, and you start bursting between the two environments that have different implementations, you start running into all these kind of uh, incompatibility issues that on the surface are not apparent, but once you start doing it, they will come up. And the higher up you go, if you start moving higher up into kind of a pass level abstraction, then this all multiplies by as an exponent, basically. Any more burning questions from the audience? 
One more? Yeah, yeah come right on. There. Yeah, please. And to this effect, I mean, I uh, to Randy, to what you just said, that uh, I think uh, OpenStack is going to be more than just the foundation. It's going to become a full stack eventually that will get optimized down the stack, in the middle of the stack, and then up the stack. And that whole stack is going to be the ecosystem that we're trying to create. Now, as far as interoperability, I think you know, to make it right, it has to work on its own native API, and the native API should be optimized for the system itself. Yeah. For the interoperability, it's no different from what happened in the database world, where you had Oracle building its own API, Sybase building its own, and then people came up with ODBC and then JDBC, and they, you know, built reasonable level of uh, interoperability, but suggesting that Sybase yeah, should win because Oracle's their, native API should become Sybase's they're API. They're building off of that SQL 92. If there hadn't been an agreement on at least some base foundation syntax, the syntax of all the SQLs are almost exactly the same. That's why an ODBC or JDBC is possible. If it wasn't for that, if there wasn't some baseline syntax, you'd be talking about huge differences like here's a JSON interface, right. here's XML, and things like ODBC would be tremendously harder to do. Well, I hear you, but the counter argument to that is that what makes Oracle a winner you know, in many in many cases today is not just the SQL itself, but the you know PL SQL and all the other things in stored procedures, all the value add, right. which are a lot more powerful and optimized to Oracle's engine and completely and so not interoperable. Exactly, but you know, but for interoperability, those who care to use the subset, and we should do the same thing. And there will be people who will do the subset that will talk to both. But if you want to solve the complex problems that you yourself just mentioned exists, you have to do it based on the based, uh, best architectural decisions that are optimized for the system itself. So the native stuff must be native and different. But for interoperability, that will happen. We will all drive it because we have to. We have customers who are coming in with that requirement and you know, people will build it. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, one more, one, let's do one more question and then we'll wrap this up. Thanks. Sorry Dave, you already got one. Let's go with my hand. <laughs> 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 What's that? Let's go with my hand. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hi, David We're Bernstein. We're all winners. <laughs> Hi, David Bernstein here. Um, Hi Dave. You know, when other industries have gotten pretty mature, uh, they have served customers well with, with standards. Uh, and there's been several of them. Things like Ethernet have gone through 30 years of innovation, uh, and there's, there's still innovation, mm -hmm. and yet uh, there's lots of different standards. Um, but, uh, you know, that has served customers well. Um, I know that a lot of custom customers are, are nervous about AWS APIs or, or other APIs, not so much from the legal side, but maybe just how do they specify what kind of cloud they want? Right now, um, governments and big companies are used to specifying, you know, standards to buy stuff in RFPs. Uh, do you guys think that we could help the adoption of clouds in mature, you know, markets like governments, enterprises who want to specify this by using, you know, standards in this equation somewhere? I think that. Um, this is a point I've made many times. I think that uh, definitely standards are good, but standards are really only possible when we're talking about the uh, industry or rather, you know, even specific technology or sub-segment where there hasn't been uh, very much innovation. And I talked about this before. It's like a lot of people, they compare, uh, you know, infrastructure to the uh, outlet on the wall. And the idea is that, you know, it's like, Sometime down the road in the near future, um, all of the infrastructure is just going to be standard, and you can just you know like plug in your application anywhere, and it'll work, and everything's commoditized. Um, and this electricity thing, it works, but there hasn't been any innovation in electricity in the last 100 years. But the infrastructure market is so dynamic and so much moving forward with such velocity that you simply can't create a standard. If you create a standard, and then Amazon creates a new service, and OpenStack spins up a new project, and then you make a new API, and you're done. And e that's Ethernet all. Ethernet is pretty plug and play, right? I'm sorry? <laughs> well, I mean, 
the, the thing is, is that I think we're still, sometimes I feel like every time we get into this discussion, we wind up, we wind up in the whole zero sum thing again. There's been tons of innovation in electricity, right? I mean, solar power, LEDs, you know, different LEDs. But they have nothing different, to do with standard, though. Well, part, they, and this they, goes to they, your internet question. They, they, you can they, standardize they, one they, thing. They, you can standardize, they, like, the networking protocol. But you cannot standardize a cloud API because it's too high level. Like, it's too, it touches upon too many things. It's too much innovation happening around there. Okay. I think let's, we've been going on for 55 minutes on this. Uh, I, I think it would be great for us to get a chance to socialize with each other at least for a few minutes before I have to head back home. To summarize, I think someone said, let's do a straw poll. I, I think that would be kind of fun, actually. Sure. Um, so uh, we have, uh, so succinctly state the, well, yeah. I, I think this is the in core, outside of core. And I think what we've, <laughs> Develop strong well, affinity or completely outside of? Well, that's or true. Like, neither one of us is really one of it. So, yeah. okay. uh, <laughs> if, we, if we are yeah. to summarize, I think. Yeah, um, go for it. Um, no, what I was going to say is that if we are to summarize, ultimately, there's not going to be any disagreements. So, <laughs> but let's, how about you summarize and then I summarize? We can, okay, let me summarize <laughs> first. <laughs> let me summarize first. I think it's a novel cause to uh, pursue API compatibility. Um, not just Amazon, but across everywhere. Um, OpenStack community should not be alienating Amazon or doing anything to the contrary of uh, um, um, not embracing its API and trying to feed off of its user base and things like that. Um, is this something that's priority one today for the OpenStack community, given the all other opportunities around the innovation and simply augmenting the stability of the system? Uh, no, I think it is not a number one priority. Randy, sorry. Uh, well, it's problematic because I'm not claiming it should be a number one priority, right? <laughs> I'm just claiming it shouldn't be forgotten in the mix. And that, you know, I don't want, I want the fact that Rackspace is now shrunken as a uh, instigator of a lot of these, of, of sort of poisoning the well around Amazon uh, to, to go away. And I want it to be really clear <laughs> that we care about compatibility with a variety of different cloud systems uh, and the OpenStack native APIs absolutely are the primary place for innovation, but we should continue to have compatibility. And I think it's a mistake to, to ignore it. Okay, so the straw poll is, if you have more affinity towards Boris's arguments, uh, raise your hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Boris. <laughs> wait, 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 let's, well, let's see if it's a non-participatory. Uh, and then, for those, for Randy, you know, the, the other hand here. Oh, wow. A little bit more affinity. Thank you very much. But there, it's a very <laughs> thin one. <laughs> we had a bunch of abstains. I, it, so uh, we just Question. tried to put a patch set back working with Juniper on the, all the VPC uh, capabilities into the EC2 API yesterday, but Russell's not going to take it because it's a little late in the cycle, unfortunately. And we just uh, tried to push back the GCE APIs. It's the same story as well because it's a Mana 3, but you can expect both of those in Icehouse, so we'll put them in the very first Icehouse release after Havana drops, okay. um, and there will be more after that. Uh, Randy, so how do people get a hold of you or follow you, and what's the website for cloud scaling? Randy Bias, R-A-N-D-Y-B-I-A-S. Um, Blogs I'm or anything? Be surprised if you can't find me. Um, <laughs> just type it into Google. You'll be good to go. Boris, like, same thing? Yeah, you can just Google me. Add zero tweets. Okay. Um, Marantis.com. Zero Boris treats with a zero. Yeah, yeah Joe, zero Joe tweets with a zero. Joe Arnold, swiftstack.com. And we'll hand it back okay. to you to close us out. Guys, how about a round of applause for these guys? Awesome <laughs> job today. Thank you. Okay, so the replay of the video is still live right now, but we had over 300 concurrents. I just checked the stream, over about 252 live concurrent viewers. Uh, so uh, lean, leaning back, watching live. Go to youtube.com slash siliconangle. You'll see an on-demand uh, replay of this video. And we're going to have some great comments on the crowdchat.net, uh, kind of the Twitter chat room that we put together for this and it's going to be on the record so if you want we're going to keep it open for an hour and then we're going to shut it down so if you want to go there log in with your twitter handle or linkedin handle leave a question and comment threads we're going to have that be a, a, a document of record for this event so go to crowdchat.net slash openstack uh, for the next hour so guys thanks a lot and uh, thank you guys for coming appreciate the broadcast thanks a lot
Thanks, man. Thank you. Careful, you have it.